In 2017, I featured Gabriella Lindsay on The Black Expat. Long before this podcast came into existence, all of my interviews were shared on the website. And if you were to read it, you'd know that Gabriella at the time was living in Mexico with her husband Vernon and their three young children. The Chicago family was very early into their expat experience, and Gabby shared how they were adjusting to life in the country. Fast forward five years later, when I decided to interview Vernon for this podcast. Not only was it a way to catch up on what the family had been up to, but it was also an opportunity to understand the abroad life from Vernon's perspective. Vernon and his family are now in Antigua and Barbuda, where they've been living since 2018 as a result of his position as a professor. From the outside looking in, it may seem like their story has been smooth sailing, going from one beautiful location to another. But the reality is, moving abroad has definitely had its ups and downs. In this episode, Vernon shares how a trip to Africa planted the early seeds of a future life overseas. He recounts how an unexpected family tragedy hastened the decision to follow that dream. And he unabashedly shares the challenges as well as the benefits to leaving your home for the unknown. Resilience is a great trait to have when you're stepping out in faith. And Vernon clearly has it in spades. Welcome to the Global Chatter. So if you've been following the Black Expat for a minute, and and many of you who listen to this podcast have been listen, have been following for the past five or six years, you might recall uh, Gabriella Lindsay, who we interviewed very early on, I think back in 2016, 2017, who shared her family story of moving to Mexico. And then for a year after that, Gabby was so kind to, you know, talk about raising kids abroad and some of the work that she was doing with coaching and consulting. Well, I feel like we've come full circle because we got our husband on today, who this is this is the first time I'm actually getting just his voice. And so Vernon is with us, Vernon Lindsay, and he is so kind to take time out today to come hang out with me and entertain my questions. So welcome to the Global Chatter Podcast. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, I, you know, I was looking at my notes and I just realized it's true. It's like, and you, you guys are no longer in Mexico, which I, I will ask you about, but it's, you've been abroad for a while at this point, wouldn't you say? We've been abroad for five years. Yeah. We left in 2016 from Chicago, went to Mexico first, and now we're in Antigua. And so I, you know, I, I think that's a great way to sort of kick this off because I, I want to get a little bit of your background. So are you, are you Chicago native originally? I am from Chicago. Yes. Okay. Born and raised. Okay. So tell me, tell me a little bit about growing up in Chicago. Did your family travel? Were you more domestic? Like what, what's, what was your story? Well, uh, growing up in Chicago, I, well, let's say this, I grew up in Chicago from about kindergarten until fifth grade. In the fifth grade, then we moved out to a south suburb of Chicago called South Holland. My father has been a pastor at a church in the city. Well, he's not there anymore, but he, he's been pastoring since he was 18. He's 70 now. And at the time when he lived in Chicago, we all lived in Chicago. Uh, he was pastoring a church in a Rosen community. And mm -hmm. he grew up in the ranks of the Church of Christ Holiness. And he became, at one point, he was the, the senior bishop. Now, he's, he still has his bishop title, but he's not the senior bishop. So we did traveling throughout the United States as a result of his teaching responsibilities, preaching responsibilities. We had to go to different conventions uh, throughout the United States. But we didn't do any international traveling as a family. That came... That came later on. So then tell me, what was your first trip going abroad? Was it as a young adult or even older? That was as a young adult. I believe I was 19 when I first mm -hmm. moved. Well, I didn't move, but I, I went abroad. I went to, to Mexico. No, I'm, I'm fast forwarding it. 
<laughs> I went to Ethiopia. I went to Ethiopia. Ethiopia was my first nice. trip, trip abroad. Right. Um, that happened as a result of, yeah. I was an African American studies major in college and my mm-hmm. aunt was working as a missionary in Benin and my okay. father, <laughs> yeah, this is it's kind of crazy how it all came together. Uh, but my father was working as uh, a trustee on a board of a, a college and they had a group of folks that were going to Ethiopia. Because of my major, because of my interests, I said, I really wanted to, to visit the continent. I really wanted to see what it was about and really experience history firsthand. My father tells me that there's this other group that's in Ethiopia. So if you want to go to Africa, why don't you go and connect with this group in Ethiopia and then also go and see your aunt who was in Benin. So that's what I did at 19. And uh, it was one of those experiences that resonated with me on multiple levels. So for clarification, because I know and I'm, I'm going to ask more about Ethiopia. Did you get a chance to go to Benin or at least see some of Benin? Yeah, yeah. So I went to Ethiopia first and then I went to, well, I got stuck in Cameroon for two days. So that was a, a added bonus. Uh, but then I did eventually get to Benin <laughs> uh, where I saw <laughs> saw my uh, my aunt who was living there at the time. I'm I'm laughing because most people know my family's from Cameroon. So when you oh, said word. you got stuck in Cameroon... <laughs> I mean, it's, it sounds like it sounds Dwala awful. Or Yonde. Yeah, yeah, uh, it sounds awful, but uh, no, it was a blessing. It was a blessing. I got sick while I was there. That's what was kind of crazy about it. But yeah. So t- I I love asking this question. What was your experiences, young black man, going to Africa for the first time, and particularly going to Ethiopia? Let kind of walk me through what that was like for you. Overall, it was a very beautiful experience. Before I went, I had, there was a part of me that was really driven and and just really wanted to be there, really excited about the opportunity. But then there were other folks who were saying, so you really want to go to Africa? What, you know, what's that like? You know, you know, they don't see you as being an African person. Why why would you do that? So I heard all that rhetoric that was playing in the back of my mind. So there's like this, this mix of joy, excitement, but also kind of this fear of like unknown, like what to expect. Uh, but that was put aside. The, the fear component was put aside within about, I would say, 15 to 20 minutes after getting off the plane because someone greeted me and said, you know, welcome home, brother. That was just like, hmm, peace, you know, and I felt I felt definitely at ease, like I had made it back home and I was very grateful for that experience. And the folks treated me like family, you know, I mean. There were some people who did definitely look at me. They would they would say things like um, they say Ferengi, which is like white foreigner. Uh, but then there were other folks who thought I was Ethiopian, you know. Uh, so I had this mix mixed experience <laughs> right. in there, you know. And uh, there was a family there who I, I came I, I I I got really close with, and they they treated me like I was their son. And uh, it made me come back. I went back three times and I extended my stay each time I went. <gasps> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, and to what you said, I think what's hard is that even what you said about some people saying kind of white foreigner in some of these languages is just because you come in from the West, right? And because race and the West can be a t- tied to it. Like sometimes that's explained to people is not that someone necessarily thinks that you are a different race. It's just, you're a different national, you know what I mean? Yeah. Passport, nationality, culture, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I get that. I, at the time I didn't understand it because I, you know, I'm, I, I'm coming to Ethiopia with a very pro-black pan-African mindset around that experience, wanting to really build some solid relationships. And when I did get that response, it was like, I'm here for you. Like we, I'm trying to unite with you. Like what, what is, what, what is this about? You know, I didn't understand that. Um, but you know, overall my experience was very positive. So that fraction of it didn't, didn't taint the experience. Do you think coming back you were you were changed in a way so when you returned home did that experience change you in some way you think it did 
it did in many ways in a very tangible way. I stopped eating chicken. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You know, when I was in Ethiopia, I, you know, I had, I had some chicken when I was in Ethiopia and it tasted completely different from what I had had in the United States. (laughs) And I said, okay, so what am I eating back in the States? You know, um, (laughs) I, I I I couldn't sit with the idea that there were probably hormones and antibiotics in the chicken that I was eating on a regular basis, and this was a this was chicken. I mean, it wasn't like it was a special or unique chicken to Ethiopia. It was just chicken without the the stuff that they add in the states. And so I said, I got to make some changes to my diet. So I stopped eating stopped eating chicken, but then also I I wanted to figure out a way to to slow my lifestyle down. Uh, because in Ethiopia, things were much more simple. And um, so that experience really shaped my mind in terms of just thinking differently about how I'm living and the things I valued. I'm laughing about the chicken because that's the first thing <laughs> my friends who come from the continent talk about when they come up here. Why is the chicken so big? <laughs> And why is it so? And why is it so soft? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. right? Mm-hmm. It completely changes your mind when you have it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. It was like I, I never used to like eating bananas in the states. And then I had a banana. I mean, obviously, I grew up in Cameroon, but later on, I had a banana from Brazil. And said, what <laughs> am I eating in the States? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> wow. things I don't normally like, I liked because I was in I was in Argentina and Brazil and it yeah. was like, this is it, right? Yeah. So I I feel you with that chicken. Like, yeah. <laughs> like people don't understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so 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 let's fast forward. So you you get you go to Ethiopia, you come back. What did you, at this point, I'm assuming you were college age, right? Mm-hmm. I'm still in college, yeah. Okay. So you, you, you already hinted on this. You studied African-American studies. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. What were you thinking you were going to do? I, I, because we're both in higher ed, I ask students all the time. So what were you thinking you were going to do with your degree? What was your hopes? I was planning to teach. I was okay. hoping to, <laughs> to go into uh elementary or high school and, and start teaching, not realizing that those positions required you to have a teacher certification as well. So uh, that made me go into the nonprofit <laughs> sector. I started working with a nonprofit there in Chicago. And yeah. that work was very meaningful. I enjoyed it. I was there for about maybe almost two years. And then I went back to Ethiopia for three months and wanted to continue doing work there. What what made you want to go back to Ethiopia? Was it was there an opportunity that came up? The, the family that I was that I met while I was there during the first time again they really treated me like family and I felt like I needed to go back and see them and spend time with them. But also an opportunity to work volunteers working with this nonprofit organization there uh, teaching English in uh, their ESL schools and uh, also being able to add to the organization in terms of the structure around the materials that they were creating. I was helping create brochures and uh, help them to to put documents together in English uh, because they were all learning English. It wasn't their first language, obviously. Uh, so it was an opportunity to build and connect with this nonprofit organization. And my plan was to stay for a year, but that didn't happen. Wait, why didn't you stay for a year, though? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Well, I, you know, the things you learn now, I mean, you realize that before you go <laughs> to to these places, right. you need to get your visa situation settled. Right. And, uh, right. I didn't I didn't quite do that. I thought that I, the plan was that when I got there, the organization would set me up and then everything would be smooth, but uh getting close to about that 3 month right. deadline that you normally get on the tourist visa I saw that that wasn't happening and yeah. I decided, okay, I can, I can stay here. Uh, I was also, I was also, I mean, full disclosure, I was also missing Gabriella a little bit, a lot. 
And uh, I was like, I can either stay here alone for another nine months and try to figure this thing out, a risk deportation, or I can just go back, be with Gabby, figure this thing out, and maybe come back. Back. Yeah. How long, how, how long had you guys been together at that point? At that point, we had been together, I guess, maybe a year or so. Okay, so pretty pretty early on, yeah. Yeah, and you and you and you weren't married yet, correct? No, we dated for five years before we got married. <laughs> okay, I'm just, yeah. I'm just yeah. making. Sure. She never told me. She never told me that part. Yeah, <laughs> I always come into y'all been married for a minute, not mm-hmm. not how long it took. Yeah, and uh, okay, so and I'm glad you brought her into the conversation because then my question is. You having this experience in Ethiopia and you building relationships with this family, did at any point as you guys were looking at your relationship start to think maybe you would go abroad? Was that ever any part of your conversation or not necessarily? When, when, so we got married in Mexico and when we were um, about to get married, we talked about just kind of throwing it out there. What if we moved here? And um, what would that be like for our family one day? And we both thought mm-hmm. it was a great idea, but we didn't know how we could possibly mm-hmm. do it. Gabby did also visit me while I was in Ethiopia. Um, so there was, we, we had already had, you know, an experience together abroad and, you know, she saw me in my element and, and I, you know, I, I saw that as a, as a part of our, our future. Um, but mm-hmm. again, we didn't know how that would happen or what that would look like. So then basically you guys eventually, as you stay in Chicago, once you get married, right? Like you got married in Mexico, but you returned home to to Chicago. Right. Were you still working in nonprofit work or were you, did you make a jump to education? What was happening with your career during that period before you guys? At that time I was, I was in grad school. I had a research assistantship, uh, but I was also working I started working at an elementary school. I was teaching Kapawada as the physical education teacher. So I was in education at that time, but not not doing the nonprofit work. You mentioned earlier that you had thought about working in elementary education overall. Were you were you pursuing the PhD to eventually get to some sort of ed leadership at the K through twelve level, or did you decide to do a different avenue within education? Now, I was pursuing a PhD because I, I knew that I wanted to, to work as a professor. I wanted to be in higher ed. I still wanted to do the outreach work, the community work with elementary and high schools. I still wanted that as a part of the work that I did. But I had this vision of working at a university and being able to write books and, and, and leading classes and lecture halls. That, that was still very much so a part of my vision. So then what, at what point, you know, so you, cause you guys have a lot going on here, like (laughs) getting through grad school, getting through, getting your doctorate, working, you know, building a family. At what point did your first move come back on your radar? This idea that, you know, you, your family, and eventually, you know, for people don't know your kids, you guys would eventually move to Mexico. At what point did you guys start thinking I, you know, you mentioned when you guys were getting married, but when did you start mm. to think, okay, we could really do this and make this practical? When my wife's mom passed away and being, being in Mexico to wrap up her affairs, we, we really had that conversation and said, you know, what are we doing? Because mm. the year prior to her passing away, she had asked us to come down there and live with her. And we were like, no, hmm. it's, it's not possible. I'm working at a university. I got this postdoc position. I've got this business where I'm hmm. teaching Capoeira in the evenings. I got a research project I'm doing. I, we had so much going on. Gabriella had a business that was starting to get off the ground. Uh, we had so much that we were doing there, mm-hmm. not to mention we had just bought a house. And we, we just, we didn't see how <laughs> it was oh possible to, to yeah. do that. But when she passed away, we decided we've got to make some changes here um, because Mm. you only get one life. And Mm -hmm. if we want to give our children a full life, then we have to bring our full selves to, to their lives. And 
we cannot do this with everything that we have going on in Chicago. How how long had her mother lived in in Mexico? Her mom had lived there for about I want to say 8 years. Oh wow. Okay. Almost 8 wow. years. Her father now, father moved there 30 34 <laughs> 35 years ago. He's from Baltimore, okay. but uh he okay. he went down there. He loved it and said I'm up. <laughs> So y'all, so basically her parents were like, you know, right now there are a lot of Facebook groups about black people moving to Mexico, whatever, yeah. but her parents were were like the OGs right. of this. They are the original. <laughs> the original the black original, people. Who moved yeah. To- <laughs> the original black people before Facebook, wow. they were the originals. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I didn't realize that her dad had been there that long. So, mm-hmm. there, so I guess throughout as you guys were dating and obviously through your marriage, did you have multiple opportunities to go down or was it just life was so busy you could only get down there when you could no we we went down there um i want to say at least twice together i know she went down there one time by myself by herself and then i came on another trip and then i i came again so we we've gone we went down there a couple of times and every time we went it was it was great (laughs) and so obviously this 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 event happens and her mom passes. And so I can't imagine given everything you guys had going on prior to her mom passing, it was going to be easy to move. I'm assuming those same things that, you know, between your research, your postdoc, her business, your young kids, you just bought a house, all of those same things were, I, I assume were still there when you did make the decision to move. Is that about correct? That's correct. They were still there. In fact, I had a I had an offer to extend my contract at the university. They wanted me to come on behind, behind my postdoc, and uh, I said no. That that was that was <laughs> that was probably the easiest part of, of the process. Um, <laughs> just because you know, I I mean, you know, you you go through higher ed and you earn these advanced degrees, yeah. and you expect to be well compensated right. for that after leaving because you have student loans, you got a family you're taking care of. And the position just didn't allow for that. And so I I said, I can either stay here, struggle with the business, the job, try to make things work, or I can go on the limb, try to create some resources for myself and give my children Mm -hmm. uh, my undivided attention. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. That's what I did. Mm. Yeah. But you know what, though? I Thank you for being honest, though, because I think sometimes when we especially think about people moving abroad and making these big life decisions, people have to understand it's still difficult. Like you had, I mean, you had some really real, mm-hmm. y'all just bought, I'm just saying this as before I moved to Qatar, I had to sell my house, right? And it's like, there are all these things you have to do and people don't realize it's not necessarily easy, but it, it seemed like because of what happened with her mom, that just kind of shifted sort of your worldview and said, hmm, <laughs> we, we can make a better life for ourselves somewhere else. Yeah, it definitely shifted my priorities. It definitely is not easy. In fact, you, you mentioned the house and that was a nightmare uh, because we put the house on the market before we left and we were not successful at selling it. We paid the mortgage on the house for at least a, a year and a half. Really? And eventually the house went into foreclosure. It was a it was a nightmare. Whew. Yeah, it was a nightmare. So we never actually I mean the bank took it from us. We we never actually Lord sold Jesus. the house. <laughs> so So yeah. <laughs> right. You separated from the house and the house separated from you. Yeah. Oh God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean and, and I mean let's talk a little bit of those difficulties. So because I know I have people who who will listen and say, okay, I don't even know, how do you even, where do you even start? So you you have a postdoc, they ask you, do you want to extend? You said no. So what did you think you were going to be able to do once you guys relocated to somewhere new? Like, what are the ideas you thought from a business financial standpoint? Well, one of the things I thought foolishly was that uh, we would create this YouTube channel. And from the YouTube channel, we would get these sponsorships and that would bring in another strand of revenue. I created the YouTube channel. I was consistent. 
created some <laughs> solid content, but that did not bring in any money. I still have it today, and that thing does not bring in <laughs> any money. <laughs> Um, but it's a great document of the things y'all have been through though it is so anyway, i, I fell ahead. in love with editing and so i appreciate it, it was definitely a creative outlet and i i'm grateful i have the videos um, but that was one of the things i thought the other thing i thought that i would do is i would travel back and forth between mexico and the u.s for educational consulting work i would go back work with some schools for a little mm-hmm. while then i'd come back to mexico um, that did not work out as I had hoped. I had a couple opportunities like that, but it was never really consistent. And then the one thing that did work out is that I hoped that I would write a book. Um, and so I did write a book, but that, that book didn't happen until, um, later. It came out to, yeah, 2018. So we moved in 2016. The book, the first book came out in 2018. And, uh, that was great. But again, it didn't create the <laughs> consistent money that I was hoping. So that's when we realized, hey, we gotta get, I got to get a job. We got to make this work some other way. Um, so, so, so now you know why we're in, in Antigua. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, I, I mean, I understand. Because you know what? Everybody makes it seem so easy. And I'm like, this is not easy. I, mm-hmm. I, don't, dis- I'm, I don't discourage anyone because the vision and purpose of your life is the vision and purpose of your life. Absolutely. That being said, though, you need to be real and you also need a plan Mm because, you know, vibes are great. We all got vibes, but let's be honest. And and in your case, you have you had three kids because your kids. How old are your kids when y'all moved? Three, four and five. Okay, see, Mm -hmm. (laughs) y'all were playing three, four and five. Mm -hmm. They were that young. Yeah. Lord. Okay. well, they were young enough that they couldn't necessarily complain about certain <laughs> like if they were teenagers let me let me put it yeah, that way yeah. if they were teenagers no, they were just happy to have us full time you know there you go there you mm-hmm. go mommy and daddy are around all the time and we get to play with our friends mm-hmm. so i think this is a great spot we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to start talking about a how you got to where you are right now and also what it's like raising those little ones who are now bigger ones Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the country that you're in currently so hold on till after the break Okay, so if, if if you're coming in from the first half, we talked about the the preparation, the moving, and, and some of the drama that came with going from Chicago to Mexico. And I, but I want to talk about even, I, we were talking about your career, but you're also a parent and your kids were really young. So from that standpoint, what was the experience that you could observe that Mexico was for your children? For my children, it was a great opportunity for them to, one, learn Spanish. That was powerful for them. You know, I started my daughter there for kindergarten, took her one day. She went through the the school and she was finished. She was like, I loved it. I had a good time. The next day, my boys were there right with her because they start school at three in, in Mexico. So I had three, four and five year old in school, full day, complete Spanish with the exception of the hour they took to learn English. Um, and it was a good experience for them to, to learn another language and to, to meet people who were all enamored with them from the moment they met them. You know, three little cute kids. They had this thick and curly hair and folks were just, they just loved them wherever they went. Mm. Obviously they were really young, but I guess, could you sort of compare maybe their experiences living in Mexico with 
at least up until to that point living in Chicago, because, you know, we got a number of folks who even think about moving abroad and their first concern, obviously, rightfully so, would be their children. So how how could you compare that, especially someone who grew up in Chicago, in the Chicago area? How how do you think that that their childhoods kind of compare to when they were living in the States? Well, when when we were living in the States, you know, we took them to daycare every day and then got back in the car and did the hour, however long it would take us to get back home. Um, they eat, go to bed, same thing every day. And then when we moved in Mexico, moved to Mexico because it was there was more time for us to be together as a family. You know, Gabby and I walked them to school every day. Then they spent their day. School is from, I want to say it was from eight to two or eight to one. It was a shorter day, uh, but we dropped them off. Then we picked them up. Then we had to go to a little cafe and have something. And then we would, we would go home. Uh, but one of the things that I know that they appreciate was the weather, being able to go to the beach any day of the week. In Chicago, you can't do that. You're limited to a very short <laughs> time of the year. Yes. Um, so a lot more, a lot more outdoor activities. Uh, a lot more time with me and and Gabby. Uh, it was different because while in in the states, it, it feels almost like their childhoods are dictated by our work and business responsibilities. Whereas when we were in Mexico, they became the center and the focus of our lives. We still had work. We still were doing things, but it never overoccupied the time that was dedicated for family. Mm. Mm. And so I'm curious then, obviously being in Mexico, was there, you know, I always ask this question, particularly with black and brown kids, obviously they're not Mexican, but in, in many, in any ways that they stand out or was it just, Oh, we know that family, <laughs> y'all are part of the community or. No, they stood out. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> because you know, my boys, they have dreadlocks, and uh, my daughter, yeah. she has she has braids right now, but she normally wears her hair pulled back in a ponytail with a big afro puff at the top. Um, so folks knew that they yeah. were not Mexican children. They didn't really know where they were from. They they thought we were Colombian. Or I don't I don't know what they thought that we were. And I always so I train Capoeira, which has some roots in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And so I always have these pants on that have Brazilian flags. So maybe I know some people thought that they were Brazilian. They didn't really know where to um, to just pinpoint their lo- location. And and they but they treated them like other children. You know, mm-hmm. uh, we definitely stood out. Folks always want to touch our hair. That was a common thing that we experienced when we would go out. Um, but they still treated them with a lot of love and. Thankfully, again, because our children had started school there, they picked up the language a lot yeah. quicker than Gabriella and I did. And so they were able to communicate and have conversations in Spanish and that that was like a saving grace. So at what point did you guys make the decision to move to Antigua? Like what at what point, how long had you been in Mexico before you decided, okay, we got to get another opportunity and time to move. Yeah, I, I would say about a year and a half in to the Mexico experience, we realized that, okay, our savings, it, it was starting to dwindle. Uh, the, the work wasn't consistent. Uh, we didn't really know what was going to happen, but we knew we needed to make some kind of shift economically in order to provide for our family and continue this lifestyle. So I started looking for jobs and I applied for the position, I want to say in November. I saw it in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. I heard back. I had an interview in January. The interview went really well. I got a uh, a call back on in February, and they were saying, hey, we really like you. We'd love to bring you, but uh, we don't have the line right now. Our budget has been uh, been cut. <laughs> so I was like, all right, back to the drawing board. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we were there, I guess, four or five months, not knowing what we were going to do. In fact, we were at a position where we were thinking, okay, we got to go back to the States and live with my parents and figure this thing out. And uh, then mm-hmm. we can decide if we're going to go back abroad. But in the mm-hmm. last minute, 
And Tika came through. They called me and said, hey, we got this money. We Are you still interested? Are you still interested in coming here? I was like, absolutely. So <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. So in about two weeks, we packed up Mexico and came to Antigua. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And said, sight unseen. We just like, we're going to do it. We're going to make it work. We know it's yeah. So I feel I feel like this is the story with all my international ed people where they looked for a while and it was quiet and then they had that one position or two positions they applied for and then everything moves really fast. Yep. It's so wild. So when you were looking for positions um and I've had Carla Fraser on who's also an international higher ed did you, were you looking at the position or were you looking at the location or were you just open to what you could do? I was open because I applied for some positions. I actually applied for some positions in the States as well as uh, okay. in international communities. And um, I won't say the school. There was one job okay. that uh, <laughs> I actually, I went back to the States for, I did a job talk and I thought it went really well, but obviously they didn't think it went really well. And um, it didn't work out. But this position did come through soon after. So I was very grateful. And the location that the job right. was in the States, I would not have been happy there. So I'm grateful that, again, it didn't work out. <laughs> so so coming to Antigua, sight unseen, which mm-hmm. I would imagine, I mean, it's the Caribbean, right? What were, you, what were your first thoughts? Because Antigua, now you're going to a predominantly Black country, right? Mm-hmm. And and this is now the first time because obviously you guys are coming from the states. You were in Mexico. You're in a predominantly black country. What was kind of the shift for you? Like, what was the experience when you landed where you are today? Well, I I thought it was beautiful for sure. I thought that I mean the crystal clear blue water and the white sands. I was like, oh man, we we really <laughs> hit the jackpot here. Uh, but as you say, yes, ninety percent of the population is of African descent. So that's like, oh, I feel comfortable here. I, I like this. This is <laughs> this is where we need to be. I'm, I'm grateful that I get to bring my children into mm-hmm. this country and to see, allow them to see uh, other folks that look just like them in, in many different positions. And it's just like, okay, this is going to be a, a good look for us. But the thing that, that, that hit us was that... Um, it's so much more expensive than life in Mexico. Yeah. Um, they depend a lot on exports and or imports yeah. and um, growing, you know, living in Mexico for two years where everything is like cut in half from life in the States and we were saving this money. And it, it was a, a shock to realize that what I used to pay for in the, the States is or in Mexico is now two and three times more than that. So it was the yeah. beauty of the island, the environment, the people, but it was also like, ah, how are we going to make this work? You know? Yeah. Because it's expensive. Yeah. yeah. And we're driving yeah. on the other side of the road. Like, how am I going <laughs> to, you know, like this is, this is, this is a real adventure here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, I mean, I think that is a trade-off, right? Especially if you're living in the Caribbean, depending where you were living in the Caribbean, right? Is mm-hmm. that you get the, you know, for the people who need it, you get the proximity to North America, you get the weather. I think you get a genuinely lovely culture, depending on what culture it is. But then things could be expensive. I mean, you want an island. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> there's finite space, right? And mm-hmm. so what did you, so when you guys move there, did you, so did they have housing for you or did you have to find housing? Like what kind of, like, what are you living in? House, apartment, flat, condo? <laughs> so they, they put us up in temporary housing, but, uh, and then, and it was an apartment and, uh, that was cool, but it, you know, there's five of us and we were in a one bedroom apartment. So <laughs> it was a little tight. And in fact, <laughs> yes. we all, we all shared a bed for those first couple of weeks as we were trying to get situated nice. i mean afterwards we found out that there was actually a sofa bed inside the couch but that was after we had moved out <laughs> so, <laughs> in those first couple of weeks you we were what? all sharing the same bed you were just bonding just bonding, just bonding. yeah <laughs> and it was all it was all good and then eventually we found a place we moved into a, a three-bedroom apartment and uh nice 
that was good for about five months until the rats came. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> go go ahead and tell the story because I'm gonna ask rats. Yeah. You say? Yeah. So I mean, that's that's what I, I think people don't understand. I mean, life abroad it is. It's beautiful, but you, there, there are challenges uh, because of the environment. And um, yeah, our first place was, it was really nice in terms of space, but the building wasn't as well maintained as it should have been. And so there was a trash receptor oh. not too far from where we lived. And mm. yeah, mm-hmm. we, we saw mm-hmm. some rats mm-hmm. on our counter, kitchen counter one morning. And that was that was pretty much oh, the no. yeah. So that was pretty much the the last the last couple of days in that place, and we moved. Um, no. Nope. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say on the floor outside. You said mm-hmm. on the counter. On the counter, y'all. I would have lost it. Ooh, yeah, Gabby who saw lost the it. rat first? Was it? A- I, I think it was okay. Gabby. She lost it. We broke our lease, and we were out of there. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. So, did you guys end up, where'd you end up moving to a different apartment or to a house? We moved into a, a house that we rented, which was about 10 minutes from where we used to, where we lived at to begin with, but uh, it was different. There weren't any rats on okay. our kitchen counters. <laughs> that, oh my God. I'm so sorry. Like, yeah. I probably would have screamed, yelled, freaked out, and fainted. <laughs> all, yeah. It all would have happened at the same time. Yeah. So, Now, I mean, obviously working in higher, you've worked in higher ed in the States and working in higher ed in Antigua. What, what is, what would you say is the differences or the challenges with the student population? So tell me a little bit about the types of students you're working with and maybe how that is similar or different to the ones you worked with in the States. Well, when I, when I worked in the States, I've had a couple of higher ed experiences. I'll I'll speak, speak from the the postdoc position because that was my last one. I was working in the honors college. And those students had very strong academic backgrounds. This is the University of Illinois at Chicago. Students had very strong academic backgrounds. They were very focused. They they knew what they wanted. Sure, they needed some help. They needed advising like other students, but they 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 were solid in terms of their abilities to do well in in school. At this institution where I am, I have a mixed bag. So the school's mission is to work with students from underserved communities to give them the opportunity to practice medicine. I love the mission. I'm all about the mission. Hmm. And I have some students who do fit that bill where they are very intentional about wanting to be physicians, but they just don't have the the background and the skills in order to to do it at this point. That's where my my role comes in in helping them to develop the skills in order to to do well in the curriculum and be able to apply what they're learning. And then I also have some students who, mm-hmm. uh, for whatever reason, couldn't get into schools in the U S or Canada, uh, but they're very competent. They, they, they have the background. They, they know what they want to do and they just need some help. Like all of us do from time to time. So if I would say that I can compare the two, it's, it's, it's a similar student body in terms of the majority of my students are from the U S or Canada. We have some students okay. from India. Uh, there's some students from different parts of uh, Africa, some folks mm-hmm. from Europe. Um, but the majority of my students that I interact with are from the U.S. Okay. Okay. And I mean, I, and I think that's probably reflective of many of some of the really great international, I'm saying international, the universities in the Caribbean, right? where there's a good number of students that are coming from North America as well as other parts of the world. To get into the medical schools in the the U.S. or Canada, you really have to be at the top of your class. I mean, these are the valedictorians Mm -hmm. that are getting into these these schools that can practice medicine, have that opportunity. So it's not that these these students aren't capable. They just were not in the very top 10% or 5% of their class in order to make it into the uh, medical schools there. And so they come here as an alternative to continue to follow that dream. So I think it's really interesting, particularly if you've got a number of students who are coming from the States. What do you think is, 
and I like asking educators this, but, um, you know, it's a different experience coming. I mean, in your case, you lived in Chicago and, and you're living on this island. But what do you think are maybe some of the challenges these students face just living, you know, spending a certain amount of time getting through school, living in an island, right? Or living in Antigua. It's a different mm-hmm. country, different culture. Um, and then, you know, we haven't even talked about kind of what the the identity makeup is of your of your student population. But do you think that there's some challenges or just some growth areas for students when they're coming from abroad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Are. For sure. Yeah. Um, a great deal of the students have never lived abroad and mm. that alone being away from family and friends outside of the country where you grew up is very difficult for some students to adjust to. Mm. Uh, I've mentioned, you know, you have to drive on the other side of the road and that's that in itself is a challenge for some students. Um, things don't move as quickly as they do in the States. You know, you have to learn to right. be patient. When you go into a restaurant, you may be there a little while. If you got a taxi cab <laughs> driver, he may, they may keep you sitting in that, that seat there for a nice hour or so while they get to you. Uh, that's just how it is. Uh, things just move slower. No problems. You know, this, this, that's just the island life. You know, you have to adjust to it. You don't have access to all the resources that you do in the States. Electronics Mm -hmm. are very expensive to buy here and you will not get the same quality that you have access to at maybe, do they still have Best Buy in the States? It's still hanging on. There's one down the road for me. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But yeah, they don't, they don't have that kind of uh, supply. We have Radio Shack. Wait, really? Yeah. (laughs) I thought Radio, Radio Shack. Shack had completely <laughs> really tanked out in the States. Really? Radio, Radio Shack, and we have Payless for shoes. See, I thought Payless had also Payless gone did. bankrupt. Okay. Payless, I know in Payless is not in the States anymore. Um, but Payless is, a, but is Payless on the is island. here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm there every few months. <laughs> Yeah, we have, we do have an, uh, there's an, there's an athletic store as well that you can go to and the prices are crazy expensive, but. Um, right. But Payless and Radio Shack, those two businesses hold my family down. <laughs> can you get um? I just like asked this question, like hmm. Amazon and stuff. Do you can, do you guys get stuff delivered at all? I'm sure it's expensive, but we, can we, you? We do, but you have to use a broker. So I I place an order in Amazon. Amazon sends it to an address in Florida. Then Florida, they Florida. they bring it in. So it, it's about, it usually takes about anywhere from two to three weeks to get anything from Amazon. And imagine paying the price of the item plus about 50% uh, in custom fees. And yeah. Sh- and shipment. yeah. That's, that's the other side of the expat life that folks don't really <laughs> know about. They don't hear about that. Um, but it's real. Say more, say more. It, say it's, more. It, it's real. I mean, that's... You have to, if you want things that you're used to getting, then you're going to have to pay for it. There's some things, yes, that you can get here, but there are certain items. For example, I just ordered a kid's uh, skateboard uh-huh. because I cannot find a skateboard anywhere on the island. A skateboard, that seems like something very <laughs> right. basic, but I cannot find them right now. There's... <laughs> there's 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 one store well there's there's not there's one main store where you can get skates Mm -hmm. and bikes and skateboards but when they come in folks buy them and then you're just out of luck you got to wait till the next shipment comes in who knows when that's gonna happen right yeah especially i think since supply chain management has been the talk of everything being disrupted with the pandemic right Mm -hmm. so I mean, even in the States, I'm going to be honest, people are getting a taste of what people in other countries go through because we're used to everything always being there stocked and full. I promise you there's a bunch of stores right now, especially grocery stores, where there are things you think would be there. They're not there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, we all get the experience now, (laughs) you know. I have that experience every week. (laughs) Right, right. Mm-hmm. And I, so tell me, you know, because I know that you you a lot of the work that you do and, and when we look at the books that you've written, you know, really have a heart for particularly 
boys and I, I'm sure, you know, there are black males in there and, and mentoring and, and identity. Are you still able to do that work while you're in Antigua? Are you still having opportunities where you can still kind of coach and mentor and educate and uplift in the ways that you were doing in some of these other communities that you've been connected and part of? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, in my department, I lead an initiative called the Men's Cave Mentoring Program. And what it does is that I meet with a group of students once a month who talk about different social and academic challenges that they are experiencing. And then I give them structured time to study the material and to teach each other the content at the end of each of our sessions. So that's one way that it continues to happen. I also teach Capoeira here. Um, I, I, my, my students are very, it's, it's, it's small right now because of the impact of the pandemic and folks have moved and, and shifted. Uh, but I still teach a, a regular class. It's not just open to men, it's open to women, children, whoever wants to come and participate. Uh, but that's another way for me to continue doing that mentoring and outreach work. Uh, then a couple of weeks ago, I spoke at International Men's Day. Uh, so I, I spoke at an event and talked about masculinity and health constructs and how we can build stronger communities from the perspective of a healthy way of understanding our, our roles within our families and communities. So, yes, I'm still doing that work here in Antigua. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, the, lo- the, sh- the short, the long answer is yes. I'm still, do- yes. I'm still doing it. <laughs> yeah, still doing it. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, and I'm curious with you. I mean, you know, the last two years in particular have been, at least as far as the U.S. is concerned, which actually just kind of spilled over worldwide, have been really intense, especially when we look at race and identity construct, especially in the aftermath of, of George Floyd. For you, I mean, you, you are in an all black, predominantly black country. You are raising young black children. You know, you've been talking about about identity for a while. What was, I think, for you kind of the impact because you were out of the country and I, I'm always really interested to hear specifically as for Black men, you were out of the country when when mm-hmm. the a lot of the unrest was happening. What was mm-hmm. kind of your perspective or, or what was your mindset or just where were you mentally kind of in the middle of that? It was, it was a, a very conflicted space for me to be in when I saw a lot of the unrest happening because there was a part of me that felt like I should be back in the States right now. I should be on the front lines of, of protests and 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 doing the work in the community that I had started doing before I left. I should continue to do that work because there's a deep need there. Then there was the other part of me it was like, you know, I need to be here to be able to, one, be here for my boys, be here for my daughter be here for my wife and be here for my family. Um, And I need to be outside of that in order to think clearly and to continue to make my contributions uh, from this space and this position and, and being a part of this global community that is also still very, very valuable. Um, When I think about George Floyd in particular, I remember having a conversation with my boys and telling them about, the situation and they didn't really understand they they're still i mean my middle son is nine and, and his brother our, our youngest is eight um so they don't they don't really understand the the depth of that and their experiences again at this point have been very mixed i mean chicago mexico antigua they don't really know the experience of the young black boy who's been growing up in chicago since you know, they were born. Um, so getting them to understand and have that conversation with them as someone who's been through that experience but now lives abroad was difficult in trying to get them to explain it, get them to understand it and being able to explain it in a way that, that it made sense to them. Um, but although they're outside of that where they are now, I know that one day they'll likely spend some significant time in the States and I'm preparing them for those interactions that they will have and those assumptions that people will have about them as a result of them being Black and identifying as males. You know, I one of the things I see a lot, particularly parents, 
you know, Black parents, I feel like we have this discussion quite a bit is how do you appropriately prepare your (laughs) Black or Brown biracial child Mm -hmm. that has grown up, especially particularly for American kids, but this could be extrapolated for some other communities. How do you prepare your child who has grown up predominantly outside of the community? Say you like you grew up in Chicago. You grew mm-hmm. like you you know what it is, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. How do you prepare them for the potential of them going back? And it may not be until, as I've talked with some parents, college. To be honest, they may have kids who've been out of the who I say out of the country. They were born in the country, maybe, but have been out of the country for almost all of their formative years. But what are some ways, at least, and I know you're probably working through it, that you feel you can at least start to prepare them for this is, you want to understand some of the dynamics of what it is to be Black and in the U.S., and particularly male. Mm-hmm. Well, I I have to tell them to, well, my my stance is that I'm very loving, but I'm also very firm uh, because while it's very important for my boys and my daughter to, to know that I love them and that I would do anything for them, I also have to be strict and very disciplined in how I, I parent them in terms of being consistent. I can't allow a lot of things to slide because there's, there's not that space for sliding, you know, when you get stopped, mm-hmm. it's late at night. Um, if they ask you to do something, you have to comply or that could be your life. You know, so I have to teach them to be very respectful. I can't allow them to um, talk, talk bad uh, or negative towards me or my wife or even their friends. You know, I have to show them that there's a level of respect that you have to treat each individual with. Because, again, when you're, you're growing up in a society where people will make assumptions based on you, as a result of your race, you have to be able to navigate those spaces. And the only way to do that is to one, have a very firm understanding of who you are, and then also be able to code switch in order to survive in those types of environments. So it's a very, you know, I, I'm, as you say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out. But I'm also very clear on how much I tell them that I love them, but also very firm in getting them to you know, follow instructions. If I tell you to do something, you have to do it. There's no like wiggle room around it because, you know, if you get stopped and they say, you know, pull out your driver's license and registration and you say, ah, you know, well, I got to get my, it, 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 no, you just do it because the hesitation could end up being your life. So. On the on the flip side, and you know, I keep re- referring Antigua a lot. Do you still? Um, l- l- let me let me preface this. So one of the things that I've heard from parents who've raised their children in predominantly black countries as, as third culture kids and abroad is that they love the fact that their kids' blackness is affirmed, mm-hmm. like their their black identity is affirmed. Now I know that your and I know that your kids are younger, although they're they're getting to that middle school age. So, <laughs> so do you, are you do you see? And I and I know it's hard to kind of compare because your your kids have kind of grown up in a, <laughs> a couple of different places. But even thinking about it, even as you growing up, do you, do you see that by being in Antigua, that is having at least some impact on maybe how they do see their own black identity or just black identities identities in general? Absolutely, yeah. I mean. There's no denying that um, they identify as Black and that they see themselves as being a part of a large community. Who they are, how they look, um, how they carry themselves is very much so reflected in the friends they have whenever we go out in the community. Uh, So I know that they're they're getting that and they're feeling affirmed and that that's something that I appreciate about life abroad for them. Mm, Yeah. Because it's different. I mean, mm-hmm. and I say that as a kid who was born in the States and then moved to a black country and then came back for college. Like it's, <laughs> it's different. So I'm, I am happy that they, mm-hmm. you feel like they're getting that affirmed, uh, uh, um, being affirmed. And so 
you know, as we start to wrap up, I, I guess, uh, you know, I always like to ask folks, what's, what's, what's down the road for you? What's, what's coming up? We got another book coming or what, what, <laughs> what do you, what, what are the, the, the things you got in your toolbox that you think you're going to put out in the world in the next year or so? Yeah, I'm working on my first novel. Um, Ooh, nonfiction yeah. or sorry, fiction. It's, it's fiction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean nice. there 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 is uh, some there's definitely some research to it so there's some there's some some facts that are embedded in that work because it does reflect my role here at the university it does reflect you know life abroad and the experience that my family has um has endured but it's also definitely a work of creative fiction and uh, I'm enjoying it I won't say when it's going to come out. I, I won't. I won't put well, myself there at, at this point. I have. I wrote a draft over the summer. I'm working on revisions now. Nice. So wow. it's coming soon. <laughs> I, I, you know what? Kudos to you. I don't know when you got time, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> to write a whole book. Well, I mean, you've been writing books, but to write, I mean, I think a fiction book, probably writing is a different process than your nonfiction yeah. work, correct? It is. It is. And uh, that's that's the joy it is that I'm learning a lot about writing in this process because it it's stretching me in ways that I didn't know were possible. Oh, my God. Oh, well. Okay, well, when you drop the book, let me know so that okay. we can put it through all of our media channels so that, no, seriously, I love reading some of the books of the folks that we've had come on here. So seriously, when when the book is ready, let me know and we will let we'll the people know. So, we'll so, oh my gosh. Well, Vernon, thank you so much for, for hanging out with me today. I um, appreciate your candor and, and the insight that you just share and I'm glad I got to talk to you because, like I said, I talked to Gabby before quite a few mm-hmm. times. So this is the first time I, I, I get I get the husband and the dad. And I, I particularly love what you were you were sharing about identity work, particularly with the students and, and your children. So we will let everyone know where to find you, including your website and your social media. We will have that up in the show notes. But thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. It took a minute, but it has finally happened. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so like I said, if if you're looking for more information about Vernon, you can definitely go to the blackexpat.com where we'll have all the information up with this post. If you look at the show notes, we'll have the links and, you know, uh, also follow us on social media. So thank you until next time. You've just listened to an episode of The Global Chatter, which is hosted by me, Amanda Bates. It is edited by Stephanie Ficchio. Don't forget to subscribe to The Global Chatter on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us on Instagram at the global chatter or stop by Twitter and find us at global chat pod. If you have a question, want to subscribe to the newsletter or are interested in sponsoring, visit theglobalchatter.com. <laughs>